MBK 1 41 the kings choose sides chapter 41 the kings choose sides while both the Kauravas and Pandavas were preparing for war Krishna and the Yadavas returned to Dwaraka Duryodhan heard of Krishna's arrival and decided to go personally to ask his assistance having learned from his spies of the Pandavas preparations the Kuru monarch had already sent messengers to every part of the globe to seek other kings assistance but Krishna was so powerful that he warranted a personal request Krishna and the Yadavas were the greatest warriors on earth if Duryodhan could secure their assistance then the Pandavas would stand no chance Krishna was their main support accompanied only by a few bodyguards Duryodhan mounted the best of his horses and set out for Dwaraka at a gallop in Virata Arjuna also thought of Krishna after consulting Yudhishthira he too decided to go personally to seek his friend's help leaving in a swift chariot he soon arrived in Dwaraka as he reached Krishna's palace he saw the palace guards receiving Duryodhan the two princes after greeting each other in a friendly way went together to Krishna's chamber they found him asleep on a large bed one of his wives was fanning him gently Duryodhan went straight to the head of the bed and sat down but Arjuna remained at Krishna's feet standing with palms folded and gazing at his face with tears of affection in his eyes after a while Krishna awoke as he opened his eyes he saw Arjuna who bowed to him in love then Krishna sat up and saw Duryodhan by his head he immediately welcomed both visitors after honoring them he inquired why they had each come Duryodhan replied it is well known that you are equally disposed toward both myself and Arjuna I have come here to seek your assistance in the war which will soon be fought among us indeed O killer of Madhu I arrived before Arjuna and thus it is only right that you assist me rather than him this is the practice of good men and you Krishna are the best of men Krishna looked smilingly at Duryodhan I accept that you arrived first O king but I saw first Arjuna therefore I think I will help both of you scripture ordains that one should help the youngest first so I will first offer my assistance to Arjuna I have an army of one million soldiers known as the Narayanas all equal to me in battle let one of you take them and let the other take me alone but I will not fight indeed I plan to leave my weapons aside during the entire battle O son of Kunti what do you choose without hesitating Arjuna chose Krishna Duryodhan could hardly conceal his joy Arjuna's sentimentality had overpowered his reason he had forsaken Krishna's invincible army in favor of Krishna himself who would not even fight what a mistake smiling slightly Duryodhan said it seems then that I am left with the army with your permission O Keshava I shall now depart having received Krishna's army Duryodhan thanked him and left he made his way to Balarama's palace he knew that Balarama was always favorable toward him surely he would take his side in the war Duryodhan found Balarama seated in his palace after greeting him with words of affection and praise Duryodhan submitted his plea Balarama his hand resting on his plow weapon looked grave O son of Karu for your sake I spoke out in Viratna's assembly at the time of Abhimanyu's marriage I pointed out to Krishna that our relations with you and the Pandavas are equal and that your cause is as just as that of the Pandavas O hero Keshava did not accept my words I cannot for a moment exist apart from Krishna therefore I have decided to help neither side I will take no part whatsoever in the upcoming war fight according to Kshatriya principles O best of men may good fortune be yours Balarama stood up and embraced Duryodhan knowing that Krishna had sided with the Pandavas he considered the Kauravas already defeated Duryodhan left Balarama's palace and went to see Kritavarma the Yadava commander in chief he asked for his help and Kritavarma in accordance with Kshatriya custom could not refuse he agreed to fight on the Kaurava side along with the million warriors already given by Krishna he thus gathered the army and prepared to leave with Duryodhan surrounded by the terrible looking forces and with Kritavarma by his side Duryodhan headed back toward Hastinapura with a light heart in Krishna's chamber Arjuna and Krishna were alone Krishna asked why did you choose me knowing I will not fight over my army there is no doubt that wherever you are there will be victory if you desired it you could slay all the Kaurus in your presence O foremost among men I too will be able to kill them all 
You are the most famous and illustrious person in the world and I will attain a similar fame by gaining victory in this war. O Krishna, it has long been my desire that you act as my charioteer. Please fulfill my desire, if you find it acceptable, it is fitting, O son of Kunti, that you measure yourself against me, Krishna replied softly. He placed a bejeweled hand on Arjuna's shoulder. I shall gladly act as your charioteer. Let your desire be fulfilled. The two friends spent some time together in Warika and then prepared to leave. Surrounded by many Yadu chiefs and warriors, they set off for Virata. King Shalaya of Madras received news about the impending war. As the brother of Pandu's second wife, Madri, he wanted to assist his nephews, the Pandavas. He had already formed a strong friendship with Yudhishthira, and he longed to see him again. Taking his army he left his city to go to Virata. While traveling, Shalaya's army occupied an area of four square miles. With their flashing armor and bright pennants, they appeared like a moving sea covered with gems. They traveled in slow marches toward Virata, shaking the earth and sending up massive clouds of dust. Hearing that the Madras army was on the move, Doryodhan arranged a regal reception for them along the way. He had palaces erected in charming spots, well decorated with gems. The corps of us sent artists for their entertainment and had the best of food and drink laid out for the entire army. Artificial lakes adorned with lotuses and fountains were constructed, with fine seats arranged around them. As Shalaya approached each place he was greeted by thousands of Brahmins, who received him with worship and adoration. He was shown to a palace that would have been suitable for the gods. Greeted with honors befitting Indra, Shalaya was pleased, thinking too highly of himself and too little of the king of the gods. Assuming that Yudhishthira had made all the arrangements, he asked his servants, Where are Yudhishthira's men? Fetch them, for I would like to reward them. The servants looked surprised. They went to Doryodhan, who had remained concealed from Shalaya, and informed him of everything. When Shalaya had become so pleased that he was ready to give away even his life, Doryodhan revealed himself. Bowing before his maternal uncle, the Korava prince said, You are welcome. Please instruct me what else I can do for you. It was Shalaya's turn to be surprised. He embraced Doryodhan and replied, I am satisfied by your reception. Ask from me what you may desire. Doryodhan folded his palms. Grant me an auspicious boon, O illustrious man. Become a leader in my army. Shalaya realized that he had been tricked, but out of honor he could not refuse Doryodhan's request. He replied, It is done. What else do you desire? Doryodhan said that he had no other desire. With joy he continued to repeat Shalaya's words, It is done. Disappointed that he would now be opposing the Pandavas in battle, Shalaya said, O king, O best among men, go back to your capital. You shall soon see me there, but first I want to see Yudhishthira. Then I will come and join your army. You may go, but please return quickly. I am depending on you. Do not forget your promise. After embracing, the two men parted and Shalaya continued on to Virata. He saw the Pandavas there and was greeted by all of them with respect. They embraced him and sat him on a beautiful seat. Shalaya gazed at his nephews with tear-filled eyes. It is good to see all you heroes hale and hearty after your exile. How have you passed these last thirteen years? Nothing but misery attends one who has lost a kingdom, but now your suffering, brought on by Dhritarashtra's son, will end as you slay your enemies. Shalaya looked at Yudhishthira sitting at his feet. O oh, great devotee of God, no one has seen even a trace of greed in your character. Like the Rishi kings of old you exhibit self-control, forgiveness, truth, non-violence, and all the other qualities that are so rare in this world. You are mild, generous, religious, and attached to virtue. O oh, chief among kings, it is fortunate that I am able to see you freed at last from your difficulties. Shalaya then told Yudhishthira about his meeting with Doryodhan and his promise to the core of a prince. Although Yudhishthira was disappointed, he agreed that it was a point of honor. He said, O oh king, you have done the right thing by granting such a boon when you were pleased at heart. You had no choice and I do not criticize you for it. Still, I have a request. You can do us a great favor in the coming war with our cousins. It is well known that you are a charioteer without equal in this world. I have no doubt that when the final battle takes place between Arjuna and Karna, you will be asked to drive Karna's chariot. At that time you should do whatever you can to discourage Karna and take away his energy to fight. 
although it is improper to ask this of you, O hero, still I ask it out of fear of the Sruta's son. We must by any and all means defeat that evil-minded one, shall I have felt pleased that, although he had been forced into fighting for Doryodhan, there was still something he could do for Yudhishthira. The news of the Pandava's exile had greatly upset him. It was outrageous that the Khorus had allowed such a thing to happen. His brother-in-law Pandu would have been mortified if he had been alive. How could the Khorus expect any good fortune when they injured men of the Pandava's caliber, and especially when they insulted a woman like Draupadi Shalaya said, I will surely do as you ask, O noble-minded one. I do not doubt that Duryodhan will have me drive Karna's chariot. At that time I will say those things which are calculated to deprive him of energy. O king, all the miseries you have endured at Doryodhan and Karna's hands will soon give rise to your happiness. This is the way of the world, O hero. Do not blame yourself. Everything is under the control of supreme destiny. It is the Lord's arrangement only that great personalities like you suffer difficulties. Even the gods are sometimes obliged to suffer. I have heard that Indra has had to endure much misery, along with his queen, Yudhishthira asked shall I ought to tell the story of Indra and how he had suffered. The Madras king recited the history in detail Shalaya was well known for his wisdom and knowledge, and even the Brahmins came forward to hear him speak. After speaking with the Pandavas for hours, it was time for Shalaya to depart Yudhishthira again worshipped him with due honor and reminded him of his promise. Assuring Yudhishthira that he would do whatever he could to assist him, Shalaya bid the Pandavas farewell and made his way to Hastinapura. Soon after Shalaya's departure, Satyaki returned from Dwaraka. He brought with him a huge army consisting of chariots, horsemen, elephants and infantry, bearing battle axes, swords, spears, lances, mallets, clubs, maces and bows of all sorts. The army appeared like clouds with lightning. A full Akshohini in number, it merged with Yudhishthira's forces like a river entering the sea. One after another, different kings came to Yudhishthira's side. Drastaki too, the king of the Chedish, came with another Akshohini division, as did the king of Magandha, Jayatsena. The two kings Pandya and Virata also each supplied an Akshohini of powerful warriors. Finally, Drupadabrata's army, assembled from various countries and led by his two sons, which amounted to two full Akshohinis. Within only a few months, seven Akshohinis stood ready at Virata to fight for the Pandavas. In Hastinapura, various other kings were coming to assist Doryodhan. They amassed eleven Akshohinis. The soldiers crowded Hastinapura and its surrounding regions so that there was hardly any free space anywhere Doryodhan had arranged for a vast army of Vaishyas and Shudras, greater in number than even the warriors themselves, to ensure that the soldiers received sufficient care while they awaited the order to march into battle. All that remained to be done was to meet with the Pandavas or their emissaries. If no agreement could be reached, and Doryodhan planned for no agreements, then the war would begin. The Khorus, informed that a messenger was on his way, waited expectantly Drupada's priest arrived at Hastinapura soon after the troops had assembled. As he approached the city from a distance, he saw those soldiers camped everywhere like masses of clouds descended to earth. Entering Hastinapura, he made his way through the crowds and came to Dhritarashtra's palace, where he was received by the king himself, along with Bhishma and Vyadora. They brought him straight to the royal court. After worshipping him with Argya and other offerings, they invited him to address the assembly. Looking around at the many kings and ministers seated in Dhritarashtra's great hall, the priest spoke. As you all know, Dhritarashtra and Pandu are brothers. Therefore, their claim to their paternal kingdom is equal. No one doubts this to be true. Yet although Dhritarashtra's sons have inherited their share of the kingdom, the Pandavas have been denied there as Dhritarashtra's sons wrested the Pandavas kingdom and wealth which they fairly acquired through the practice of virtue. Even before that, the Kauravas attempted to kill their honest cousins in different ways. Because the Pandavas' life duration has still not expired, the Kauravas were unsuccessful in their attempts. Despite all this, Yudhishthira bears no ill will toward them. He has accepted all tribulations without complaint. Now he wishes only to have his rightful property returned. Although he has suffered the severest miseries, in this court, in the forest, and at Virata, he does not long for war, the priest paused and looked at Dhritarashtra. 
The blind king shifted uncomfortably on his throne. Shafts of sunlight entered through the lattice windows, illuminating his pained expression. By his side Bhishma and Vidura slowly shook their heads, remembering again the terrible day when Pandu's sons had been sent away. They looked intently at the priest as he continued. The Pandavas wish for a peaceful settlement. They do not want to gain back what is theirs by ruining the world. Forgetting their troubles these last thirteen years, they are prepared to live in friendship with their cousins. But their kingdom must be returned. They have gathered seven Akshohinis and prepared them for battle. Although you have a greater force, you should not consider yourselves more powerful. The Pandavas have Krishna on their side, who possesses inconceivable power. They are also assisted by Drupada, Pandyat, Drishtaduna, Shikandi and other mighty monarchs. Each of the Pandava brothers is Amalaratha Arjuna alone exceeds the strength of your entire army, O descendants of Bharata. What man would dare face Don Nanjaya when he comes out to fight, his chariot guided by the immortal Keshava? Therefore act according to virtue. Give back what should be returned. Do not miss this opportunity. The assembly remained silent when the priest had stopped speaking. Everyone's eyes turned toward Dhritarashtra. It was up to him to respond. The Karun monarch said nothing. Duryodhan smiled and glanced at Karna. This old priest was wasting his time. They had an army almost twice the size of the Pandava's forces. Where was the question of surrendering anything to Yudhishthira? The core of a prince looked around the assembly at the silent kings and ministers Bhishma broke the silence. He thanked and praised the priest with gentle words. Then he said, O learned one, it is fortunate that the Pandavas are doing well and that they have secured the assistance of many kings. It is especially fortunate that Damodara, Krishna, has taken their part. It is fortunate indeed that they desire to act virtuously and that they wish for peace. You have spoken the truth. Your words are sharp in keeping with your status as a Brahmin. All the Pandavas have borne many troubles and are certainly entitled to their father's wealth. Not even the holder of the thunderbolt could keep that from them, what to speak of those bearing the bow. There is little doubt, as you say, that Arjuna alone can defeat our army. He could stand against the three worlds, Karna sprung to his feet. Catching Doryodhan's eye he barks at the priest, insolently interrupting Bhishma. O oh, Brahmin, you are wasting your time Yudhishthira was fairly defeated and went to the forest in accordance with his vow. I do not believe that the prescribed term has even ended. Why then are the Pandavas demanding their kingdom Doryodhan will not yield even an inch of land out of fear, but out of virtue he could give the entire earth. Let the Pandavas first keep their vow and then come humbly before Doryodhan, who will doubtlessly afford them refuge. If they desire to abandon righteousness and seek battle, However, they will meet only grief, Karna glared. Both he and Doryodhan refused to accept that the Pandavas had fulfilled their vow. They did not believe that Bhishma's astronomical calculations were correct. According to their own estimations, there were a few months left Doryodhan would not even consider negotiating with the Pandavas. The prince nodded in agreement as his friend spoke Bhishma turned toward Karna. O oh son of Ratha, why do you talk so much? Do you not recall how during the fight in the Matsaya kingdom Arjuna single-handedly defeated all of our principal warriors, including you? You have seen his prowess often enough. If we do not do what this Brahmin says, we will all be killed. Some of the kings present agreed with Bhishma while others praised the Karna. The hall buzzed with voices and Dhritarashtra raised his hand for silence. He rebuked Karna, then solaced Bhishma. Then he addressed the assembly, in my opinion, Bhishma has spoken well. He speaks for our interests and for the interests of the entire world. I need time to deliberate. Let the assembly be adjourned. O oh, Brahmin, go back to the Pandavas and tell them that I shall send Sanjaya soon with my reply. After the priest had been worshipped by Dhritarashtra's court Brahmins, he left the assembly. Everyone then returned to their own abodes, leaving Dhritarashtra alone with his personal servants. The blind king pressed his hands together. There was no doubt that Bhishma had spoken wisely, as he always did Dhritarashtra could not ignore his assessment of the situation, especially when it was shared by Vidura, Drona and Kripa. These were all learned and virtuous men. Now they were imploring him to control Doryodhan and return Yudhishthira's kingdom to him. But whenever he spoke to his son he felt powerless in his hands. Even when he tried to instruct Doryodhan in righteousness, Doryodhan simply laughed. 
The prince's view of righteousness did not include justice for the Pandavas. It seemed that providence was in control and that they were all moving inevitably toward some divine plan. Dhritarashtra sighed and loosened his heavy royal robes. Perhaps he should take stern action and have his son chastised and even imprisoned, but he simply felt unable. All he could do was advise the prince for his own good. After that, it was between him and his own destiny how he chose to act. The king called for Sanjaya. Sanjaya was intelligent and affectionate toward the Pandavas, he would certainly be the best man to send as an envoy to them. He would know what to say to pacify them. Perhaps he would even be able to prevent a war. Sanjaya entered the room and, after he had announced himself, Dhritarashtra said, O oh Sanjaya, the sons of Pandu are now living in Virata. Please go to them and convey my feelings. O oh learned one, I have never heard of faults in those men. Even now, after suffering so much at our hands, they remain friendly toward us. They act only to acquire virtue and never fall into ignorance, folly or laziness. Those heroes have conquered their senses and live only for others' benefit. They have no enemies other than that great weak-brained fool, my son, Doryodhan, and the still meaner Karna Doryodhan is strong only at the beginning of endeavors because he is so given to indulgence. Still, he thinks himself capable of robbing the Pandavas of their rightful share. Who could hope to stand against Yudhishthira, Keshava, Arjuna, Bhima, Madri's twin sons, Satyaki, and the other great kings? Indeed, Arjuna alone, with Krishna guiding his chariot, can subdue the three worlds. His arrows fly in clouds, roaring like thunder and sweeping away everything in their path. Dhritarashtra had thought about the upcoming battle again and again. He knew his sons did not stand a chance. Although they had a bigger army, that would not stop the Pandavas, assisted as they were by Krishna, from winning Dhritarashtra revealed his fears to Sanjaya. No one can hope to conquer Krishna, he is always victorious. He is the best of all men and the lord of the worlds. With his support the Pandavas could, I am certain, stand against the celestial host, headed by Indra and Mahadeva. Just he and Arjuna together have already shown their power at Khandava. What then can we expect when they are united with Bhima and the twins? Our army is finished. The Pandava's power is inestimable. O oh Sanjaya, let me tell you about the other kings who have rallied to their cause. Dhritarashtra had already heard from his spies about the situation in Virata. After listing all the kings supporting the Pandavas, he again turned to the discussion of Krishna. It was Krishna he feared. Just see how easily he had slain the mighty Shishapala, Naruka, Kangsa, and so many others. He is surely Vishnu incarnate. Thinking of Krishna's power and Vishnu's deeds in former ages, I find no peace, O son of Gavole Ganii. Perhaps the only person I fear more is Yudhishthira. I do not fear anyone as I fear him. He has long practiced austerity and dedicated himself to virtue. Whoever receives his wrath will be consumed like a reed falling into fire. His cause is just. This also frightens me. Therefore, go on a swift car to the high-minded Pandava and speak affectionate and kind words. Tell him that I desire peace and will comply with any request he makes. Inquire after his welfare and that of his friends and followers. Say whatever you feel is appropriate to promote the interests of a race. Do not speak anything which will give rise to hostility, without offering assurance that the Pandavas would regain their kingdom. Dhritarashtra gave his own message to Sanjaya and then asked him to leave at once.